What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And we do that by highlighting the practitioners that make this the best field to work in athletics. And we are having Zach Nielsen on the show. Zach, we're coming on. It's going to be a little bit of a different episode. Thank you for coming on, brother. And uh, I'm excited to get to share Sophia's story together. Yeah, man. I've been looking forward to this since you mentioned it. So, uh, it will be it will be a lot of fun. Make it hard, make it heavy, but that's life. It is. So uh, to provide some context, uh, you know, I'm gonna let you provide context. Talk about Sophia's story, um, and we'll just kind of unravel this together. Yeah. So um, for everybody who doesn't know who I am, um, like many of you, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I work with the military now. Uh, but was a collegiate strength and conditioning coach before. And a big thing that kind of took me out of college sports was when I became a father. Um, I had my oldest daughter, Charlotte, in my first full-time gig. I uh, moved my pregnant wife across the country from our entire family to mm. take that job and uh, quickly realized, like, this isn't really going to be a long-term thing. I'm not going to do this to my family over and over again. And uh, so I heavily lean into more being myself as a husband, myself as a father, than I do a strength coach. Um, I love my job. I love what I get to do. I love the service members I get to work with. It's just, that's not who I am. It's what I do. Um, so we had my youngest daughter, Sophia, like a week before the pandemic in 2020, she was born in early February. Um, and first year and a half or so, everything was, was standard, right? She's a kid. We're big energy, having a blast. Everything was locked down. So we're hanging out a ton as a family. And in, uh, in fall 2021, she started just being super lethargic, uh, had pain in her legs, wouldn't eat anything, would wake up screaming in pain in the middle of the night, just like stuff, you know, 18 month old shouldn't be doing. And uh, we finally got, because we, funny enough, and this will be a reoccurring theme throughout this whole story, we're getting ready to go on a family trip to Disneyland. (laughs) And we had to figure out what was wrong so we could take her and go. And uh, so I told my wife like, hey, go take her into the ER, have them run whatever tests they need to run. And we're going to figure out what's wrong because like this was the week before Thanksgiving and the first week of December, we were supposed to be on a plane with with my parents, with my mother-in-law, like whole big family trip. So yeah, uh, ran every test under the sun and she got diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and it was uh, November 18th, 2021. And so we admitted, right? Okay, cool. We're going to, jump in we're going to dive into this thing aml is very studied so like here's your treatment track here's what your milestones are all that perfect my wife and i are very plan oriented people so we were able to kind of wrap our heads around it and say cool next six months we're locked in a hospital where we live 25 minutes away from the hospital so like alternate days as needed make sure our oldest daughter's got the love she needs all that um and then so that was a thursday monday our primary oncologist comes in and says like, Hey, I need to talk to you guys. Like, can we go to another room? And we're like, yeah, sure. And, um, they told us they'd run some more genetic testing and that she had been her particular strain of AML, if you will, um, was just essentially brand new, no standardized treatment track. Um, they said like, Hey, that plan we gave you that on paper looks awesome and has milestones gets crumpled up and thrown out because there isn't a plan. So that changed things a bit, obviously. Um, fortunate for us, the like one guy in the world who studies it is 30 miles north of me in Seattle, working at Fred Hutch. (laughs) And so we got on a zoom call with him (laughs) and, uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Machinsky is his name. Talks us through it, right? Hey, this is, you know, here's what we have to do. We have to still do normal treatment. You have to fail normal treatment. We have to go through cycles and show that it is not working for you to get this. It's called compassionate use of a drug geared towards a different type of cancer because he's been running studies because, like I said, the one guy really researching it. And he's seen that this other drug has an effect as long as we have the, the receptor, the cell receptor. And we're like, okay, cool. And so eight weeks, two rounds of chemo. We saw, we went from 
60% present in her marrow in November to they did a draw. And these dates are like cemented in my head. It's really it's crazy. Jan January 5th, 2022, they did a draw and we had gone from 60% present to 95% cancer present in her bone marrow. So like that sucked. Um, and she was, you know, huge fever. We were admitted after her bone marrow draw. I was with her that night in the hospital. It was, it was pretty somber, but we got, that gave us the go ahead to try this new drug. And, uh, that night we're sitting in the room, right? Heavy as can be. Called all the family, told them what's going on. Called my wife, said, hey, we get to try this new drug. But I mean, soap's in rough shape, right? 105 degree fever, 95% cancer present in her marrow. It's like 2 a.m. I'm holding her. And uh, she reached up, reached up and tapped me on the nose. Like, boop. And uh, I was like, all right. Let's ride. Like my fear the whole time was, you know, my wife and I have been through some stuff in our lives. I'm fortunate. Um, my wife is my only girlfriend. I started like oh. dating her right in seventh grade. <sighs> and awesome. uh, so we've grown up together. We went through the loss of family members. Her dad died when we were in high school. We went through that. We've been, we've been through some shit, man. I could swear, right? A hundred percent. Okay. <laughs> And so I knew we would be fine. We're going to do this because that's what we do. I was worried about my daughter's will. And after that, it's like, all right, let's ride. She's down. And uh, so that was, like I said, January 5th, 2022. By mid-March, so four doses of this drug that might work, right? By mid-March, we were in full remission going for a bone marrow transplant. Yeah. And uh, so we'd, you know, we'd beaten it. Went and got the bone marrow transplant. Um, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of little stuff. Like in the middle of all this, right? We all got COVID as a family. Oh COVID's God. not that big of a deal unless you're immune compromised. And I have a kid with cancer. So like, it was a big deal. <laughs> um, my truck got stolen that Christmas from the hospital. Like... So, uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff, right? This whole thing has been about life perspective because like many people, I was 2021, I had four W2s, not because I changed jobs four times because I had four jobs. I was teaching online for two schools. I was coaching with the army. I was coaching high school football. I was on the grind, right? I was trying to be able to Western Washington's expensive. I was trying, thinking like, I have to do all of this just to make my family comfortable to be able to live here. And there was a lot like I just wasn't there for. And uh, a big, a big life shift happened when all, when she got diagnosed, quit a bunch of my jobs. Um, luckily the army commander I was working with at the time was super supportive. Like I told him what was going on and he went, cool. Um, you're not my soldier, but your place of duty is the hospital. Your place of duty is your family. Take care of them. I don't care if I see you the rest of the year. Go be dad, go do what's important. So like, I was in a very fortunate situation from that standpoint. And even, you know, there was plenty of times, like the first week we were in the hospital, once again, perspective, we're down. Why is this happening? How can this happen? And then a baby gets ditched at the ER and the parents take off my life is now automatically way easier. And it, it like, there's a kid who now is living because the nurses take care of them. And, and so who am I to look at my situation where I've got, my wife and I are both from here. So we have our entire families for support. I've got a massive network of people who are doing everything they can to help us. Um, and it got us, it's what has gotten us through. It's what got us to, you know, my truck got stolen and I had a soldier I worked with call me and say, I have a spare car. It's Christmas morning. Posted on Facebook. Hey, my truck got stolen. You know, fuck me. Right. And, uh, he called me like, Hey dude, my kids aren't up yet. If you need a car, my wife and I'll drive down and give you a car. Do you need presents? I will go to the store. Like <laughs> phenomenal to where I, once again, like my problems became small 
because they got taken care of from the people around us. And then it worked out, right? We beat it. Um, and then we went through the process. Those, if, you know, pe most people aren't going to be familiar with bone marrow transplants. They essentially chemically kill you to bring you back to life with new marrow. Jesus. Yeah. So like, um, we're, you know, Seattle Children's luckily great place. Seattle Children's Hospital is awesome for this. So that's where we were. And she got donor marrow fresh because there was somebody close enough to where we didn't have to, you know, pull it from some other state. I also, <laughs> my wife and I are of course worried, like, are we going to be able to find a good match? If we don't find a good match, the likelihood of relapse is very high. And our doctors looked us dead in the face was like, you have a blonde haired, blue eyed white daughter. Um, <laughs> we'll find you a match. <laughs> it, it was, I mean, there's a lot of those mini comedic relief moments through all of this, but, uh, and it was like, oh, okay. And sure enough, the next week we got like 30, 10 out of 10 matches for all the factors. And it was like, cool, not a problem. But, um, you know, once again, we're, yes, Seattle's 35, 40, 40 miles from my house. Um, but my wife was working virtual because she works for an online university. So like half the week she was up there at the hospital when we were inpatient. And then I would switch her on like Wednesday or Thursday afternoons. And I was there the other half of the week. Um, the unfortunate side of things is 21, 21, 22. So like all the mm -hmm. COVID stuff was a big deal. Yep. Um, especially at a hospital that deals with cancer patients and, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the state of Washington, who was pretty strict on all their COVID stuff. So, um, my oldest daughter didn't get to see, so my daughter, Charlotte didn't get to see Sophia for a month. Um, and mind you, they're like, Hey, if yes, we know this, this is a, a a procedure we're accustomed to, but like, if it doesn't go well, like there's a likelihood because she'll be immune compromised, like that she could, she could pass away during the process. And so it's like, okay, like we have to get through that first month to where, cause then we can be together as a family again. Um, we got, you know, Ronald McDonald house access, which was awesome. So it two bedroom apartment across the street from the hospital in essence. So we were able, weekends, we were able to be a family. We were able to be all together. Um, still couldn't do a ton of stuff because of her, you know, immune compromise and all that. But like, even if it was sitting inside and the girls were playing, um, we had a, a number of foundations. Uh, See you later, Washington's a big one for us. They're amazing people. They hooked us up with so many gifts and so much support and so like, so each of my girls had a new scooter. They were racing each other back and forth in the hallways of this apartment. Um, my oldest daughter learned how to drift it because it was those big plastic <laughs> wheels on hardwood floor. So then they were drifting their scooters. And... <laughs> it was, uh, it, I mean, it, it was great. Coming from what we'd gone through, it was great. Um, and then, so that was June was when we got into Ronald McDonald House, June 2022. And that was life. Two months, two or three months of that. We came home end of August um, doing the split thing. And like, it, you know, I got COVID again in the process. So like I had to stay home one week. My wife had to cover the whole week in Seattle. Um, just a, it's a lot of that type of stuff, right? We're dealing stuff that doesn't, that I call like normal people problems now. Um, isn't that big of a deal until you have this thing, this thing that like, Oh, this, it actually matters. Like, it's not just, Oh, somebody's going to be laid up for a couple of days and then they'll be fine. No, like this can kill my kid. So let's take the precautions. Um, and then she got to come home. She came home in late August, 2022 and following a bone marrow transplant, you have one year of don't do anything. Don't be more than a half hour away from your hospital. So we didn't do a lot. We, you know, we watched her, her numbers and everything climbed well, her immune numbers, everything was coming back. Um, I mean, we're talking like days ahead of schedule. She was already growing neutrophil cells and white blood cells and things. So we were, you know, we're super excited. She was accepting the marrow. And then I think it was October, 2022, like we did a bone marrow draw to check how things are going. And she had like the most minute, uh, basically the only amount that can show up to show that it's present of leukemia showed back up. And it was like, okay, that's weird. 
oh, our doctors weren't concerned. They're like, that's fine. This happens. We've got uh, protocols. November, it was gone. December, it was back. January, it was gone. And we did this back and forth and back and forth. And uh, from what we've learned now, um, her type of leukemia, it's like barnacles. It, it loves to clump together and then grow. And so how wherever they drew from on the bone, like, because they pull out of her hip. So, like, on the bone, if they don't draw from a place where there's a stack of barnacles, it can show nothing. And so that, from what we were learning, like, that's kind of what was happening. There was some cells circulating. But whether or not we grabbed them is what determined whether or not it showed that we had disease present. And so that was kind of, it's disheartening, obviously. Like, you don't want, I mean, shit, dude, we just, we're still, I watched my daughter, like, stick her tongue in death's face for a year. And then it starts coming back. And it's like, God, we, we got to do this again. And, uh, but once again, we were back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We cleared the year mark post-transplant. Um, we were able to go to one of my good friend's weddings. So we took like a three-day road trip to Montana, which was awesome. Our last family vacation before she got diagnosed was to Montana, uh, which is like a 10-hour drive from here. And so it was, it was awesome to be able to take another family trip, go see one of my closest friends get married, uh, take both my girls, right? Like do this awesome family thing. And then we came back and that was July. Like we had a marrow draw before we left and we came back and got a call that she had had a giant growth. Like we went, uh, we went from, you know, enough present to tell us it's there, but not give us a number to 30% present in the marrow again. And it was like, oh shit, like, here we go. Okay, here we go again. Um, the, the biggest difference with that one was she had lost the, the cell receptor from the drug that worked the first time. And don't ask me how that happens. I, I, I've learned a lot about leukemia and, and cancer in general, but I don't, I mean, it learned. It's the only thing I can put it as. Her, her cancer learned what killed it and grew back to where it couldn't be killed by that again. And so, and it was like, okay, cool. Jump on a protocol. Uh, they told us basically the, the, the way that we get past this is we have to do a second bone marrow transplant, which is terrible. Um, super hard on the kid, super hard. In, it's way harder the second time. And the way they put it to us as well was like, there aren't third bone marrow transplants for kids. So like we're swinging for the fences here. We got to get this stuff taken care of and we got to get it cleaned out and get her new marrow. And if it comes back, um, the way we put it, because we we had made a lot of friends who've lost their children in this process. Um, we didn't want to hear, just take her home and love her. Because a lot of people had. And so like as long, and that's where, I mean, as I said, my wife and I are very like make it happen type people. And it, it became very evident, very quick. Like our mindset was as long as she's alive, we are in it, we're in this. And that was, that's what we did. Uh, we, we started a drug regimen. That's like a standard AML. Oh, you relapse. Cool. We'll try this. And it worked pretty well. We went from 30% to 0.9% present. Um, so we're stoked, right? Cool. It's, it's working. It, as far as we were concerned, like we hadn't been given reason for it not to work ever in her in her treatment because like even the like oh this might work drug absolutely knocked it out of the park so it, it was working we were moving that was uh september and then we did the draw in october after another month of treatment no movement we're like okay that's not bad um what we what we eventually learned is if with her type of leukemia if there was no movement it means the drug stopped working it meant that it, from, it, looking back now, obviously, okay. um, yeah, if there was no change, positive or negative, it meant that like that month, it stopped working. And so, and they told us that they said, hey, um, this isn't a negative in terms of like her cancer is growing. This just means like we need to see what next month looks like, because if it grows next month, it means this drug doesn't work anymore. Sure enough, grew in November. Hey. Um, and that's when they basically said, like, you guys are out of options. Uh, the clinical trial route is the route you're going to have to go. So we'll see what's out there. And um, please be patient. And it's like, 
at least from my standpoint, like I, I'm a bit more aggressive. My wife's very like, okay, cool. Thank you. We'll get, talk to other parents, gather information, get online and see if she can find any trials that are open. And I'm like, what do you mean be patient? Like very, I, the, this, the urgency of all of it felt, it was just always very real for me of like, if we are not, if we're not beating it, is I call it, you know, call it the strength coach in me. If we're not getting better, we're getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and that was this last year, man, you know, December we were, she was in good enough shape. We were able to go take a trip. Uh, we, we have Leavenworth in the middle of the state, which is this nice little Bavarian village nestled in the mountains. So we went, you know, took off Christmas morning, brought the dog, packed everybody in, drove over, had a great couple days in the mountains, which was awesome. Came back and it was like, okay, we need to find a trial. And they said, okay, cool. We found one. Let's, let's see if we can get you in. It was in um, Houston, Texas at MD Anderson. Long story short, it took about a month, but we got in. I remember it because it was my mom's birthday. I got an email. Hey, you guys are in 24 hours later. Not even that day. Like I got the email at like 9 a.m. Called my wife because she hadn't checked her email. Called all the family. My wife called the, the hospital, said, hey, we are in. They brought soap in, gave her platelets, gave her blood, pumped her full of antibiotics. And got us on a flight. My wife took off at 5.45 the next morning with Soph. They flew to Houston where the trial was four months long. So we were saying, okay, you guys are going to be gone for four months and we'll see you when we can. Like, but this is obviously important. Um, so we went, you know, traveled back and forth a couple times. She was doing really good at first. And so I, like, she told me she needed her car. So my dad and I hopped in the car up here on a Friday morning and got it there by Sunday morning. I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, Seattle to Houston is quite the drive. <laughs> What's terrible too is like I, one of my neighbors had done it before and I was talking to him about it and they're like our super close friends, our kids are best friends, all that. He was like, I made that drive once, did it in about like 48, 49 hours. And so my dumb ass was like, cool, we can beat that. 47. 45. <laughs> 45 hours, but a yeah, terrible idea. It was Super Bowl weekend. I remember staying up on our connecting flight from Houston to Atlanta because we flew Delta. Um, so staying up to watch the Super Bowl on the connecting flight, and then as soon as I sat in the seat on the flight from Atlanta to Seattle, that was I woke up in Seattle. Like it was, it was terrible. It was a blast. Like a bunch of funny stories from that trip between my dad and I both. But um, and then like so we drove her car down. Cool, and then the trial just beat the crap out of her and another little girl who was there with the same type of leukemia. Um, and it just didn't work for us. Didn't work for us. Worked for the other girl for a time being, but it just, it, I mean, made their bones brittle. It was it just a bunch of random stuff, blood sugar spikes, fevers are like high, 103, 104 degree fevers, like almost every night type of thing. There were, my uh, self was constantly in and out of the ICU and the, the beauty of my daughter and the beauty of why, why this, this whole thing has moved a lot of people. Um, she smiled the whole time, laughed, giggled, made jokes, talked crap to the nurses. Like it's just, just, she was such an amazing little girl. Uh, so like she'd be sitting, there was one night, uh, my wife has this awesome picture of it. They were up. 2, 3 a.m., so spiked a fever. They couldn't get it under control. She had antibiotics in her system. They, they had ice on her. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And, like, when you're in those situations, and I, I got to do it once, and I have – every time I do something my wife makes look easy, uh, I realize how amazing she is. Because, like, I was in the – I was we were down there visiting. I told my wife, you take your shower, go around McDonald's house. You guys have fun, spend time. I'll do the hospital thing while we're down here. Like, give her a break because she's down there by herself. Um, like we have one friend in Houston, she has some family in San Antonio. And other than that, there's no one. So I'm there. I wake up in the middle of the night, room full of nurses and doctors, everybody's talking and, blah, 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 blah. and like my wife told me she always like waited, like would sit and wait for like a nurse to come over. And that's not how I am. So like I sat up to a room full of people and listening to the heart rate monitor go like crazy. And I just went, can you tell me what the fuck's going on, please? <laughs> And the nurse walks over, hey, sorry. And she was super nice, but like, 
don't want to wake up to a room full of doctors with my daughter asleep in bed, but everything's going wrong, apparently. Like, what are you doing? And so I'm a bit more direct. So I, you know, asked. <laughs> and she, they were worried because she had spiked her blood sugar. Um, and they couldn't figure out why, because as far as they knew, she hadn't eaten anything or this or that. But it was like 11 o'clock and I door dashed teriyaki and she crushed it. Like four cups of rice, crushed it. And I was like, does anybody know how insulin works? Like, I'm not surprised her blood sugar is high. She ate a whole bunch of rice two hours ago. Like something tells me your, your body's, her body's doing what it's supposed to do. She just hadn't been eating because she didn't feel good. So it was just, but like stuff like that, 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 that was the norm for there for a while. Um, so they were there for two months and then we went down, might've been president's day weekend. No, sometime there, middle of March, we went down and, uh, they did a bone marrow drop and we're obviously, this is a trial drug. It's not only us trying to make sure our daughter's getting taken care of. It's this, this hospital, these guys, Andy Anderson, um, this hospital who's doing a trial, who's trying to see if this drug they saw positive results with in adults has the same effect on kids. And it came back and we had, so when we, when they went down there, her cancer had grown back up to 80% present, um, at this junction. So two months into this trial, we were back up to 96% present. So we were back up high and it was like, okay, this, this obviously isn't working. And which at that point, right, we've already been told we're out of options. We've already been told like clinical trials are going to be the route you got to go. And, um, lucky the, the Dr. Bronco, the guy who was running the trial, he is like my wife and I, if she's alive, we have a chance. So he came in like the in that hospital, they had a, a normal pediatric oncologist who would come in and like, yeah, this is what we're seeing this or that. And then we're like, cool. We don't know you. We want to talk to the guy who called us down here. <laughs> um, so he came in and told us, he's like, yeah, it looks like the drug's not working. Um, I don't want to up the, and she also had like terrible, almost allergic type reactions to the drug. Like it would make her flush red. It was just a bunch of things, right? Like I said, just beat the crap out of her. Um, and he's like, so obviously the drug's not working and it's also being terrible on her body. So, uh, at this point it's safest to pull her out of the trial. And my wife and I were of course devastated because that was our shot. And, uh, he's like, and so we, we, I mean, we, we voiced our concerns, right? Do you have any other trials? We'll stay here if you have another trial. Um, if it at least matches her cell markers, right? Um, we'll, we'll stay as long as we need to, right? Not, not all of this is for nothing. If we can't beat this cancer and go live life. So whatever we need to do. And he was like, ah, we, we have one, but she's too small, which the way he put it, not looking back on it now, he's like, yeah, she's got to be like 45 kilos. And I'm like, she's four. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and on average throughout her treatment, she weighed between like 14 and 16 kilos. Right. So around. 30 to 35 pounds, 28 to 35 pounds or whatever it is. <clears throat> and so um, when he said that, I was just like, that's, don't even, you don't even say that, dude. Like that's three times for body weight. Like, but uh, he's like, yeah, we might have that. I can see if there's some other stuff. He was working on developing another trial. And, uh, and he's like, but I do have this drug regimen, right? That should give you some time. And we're like, well, what's time? Is it a week? I mean, unfortunately, when you're doing this stuff, when you're, when your kids are going through and I mean, not just kids, I have a buddy who's going through uh, cancer treatment with his wife and he deals with the same stuff. Like, am I going to wake up this morning to them dead? And I, I mean, I speak very bluntly about this stuff because it, it's just how I am. But like every morning from the time we heard she had 95% cancer present again, Every time I went to wake her up in the morning, that was my thought. Like I would walk in and watch before I would do anything else. Because like, if she's not breathing, like, you know, alarms go up. But so I was like, you know, what, what are we, is time a day, is time a week? She's in rough shape. Like I said, the, the drug had made her bones brittle. She had fractured her hip, wheelchair bound at four years old. Like, and so I was like, what, what does time look like? We were waiting on our guy in Seattle. He was working on developing a drug, um, which unfortunately we, you know, it got pushed back a year in essence because of some some negative side effects they were seeing in the testing. So, but he was super excited about that. So we're and this is March, and he said summer. 
which like summer in Washington is very subjective because summer doesn't start here <laughs> until July. So <laughs> are we talking summer months or are we talking summer <laughs> weather? But um, so it was, you know, and it was one of those things like, what, what, what are we actually talking about? When you say you can buy us time, what does that mean? And he was like, I can buy you. If you need months, we can get you months, right? Like uh, despite super high cancer, despite all of that, Soph was the healthiest kid they had seen go through their trials. Um, just took it on the chin like a champ. Obviously, like the fevers and stuff and the, the fractures and all that. Like, But she was herself the whole time. Like every hospital we've been to, she's everybody's favorite patient. She runs the halls, like <laughs> talks to the custodial staff, talks to the nurses, gets whatever she wants. Um, that's just, that was my, that was my girl. So it was that way in, in, in MD Anderson as well. And um, so he was like, she, you know, this kid that we're looking at today is she's sitting there like playing Play-Doh in bed. He goes, the, we give her this drug regimen, we will get you time. I don't know how much, I don't know for how long this will last, but she's healthy enough that we can get to summer. And we're like, okay, what does that mean though? Does that mean here? Does that mean home? If, it, if we get the choice, we're gonna choose home. You know, if we're coming into the last portion of her life, potentially, I don't wanna be 2,500 miles away from my family. And unfortunately at this point, uh, I work for the, like I'm a legitimate federal employee now working with uh, my strength and conditioning job. So like, rules apply pretty heavily um so like i wasn't fmla uh, eligible yet like family medical leave as much as we have that in the state of washington it's awesome i hadn't been at my position a year yet so i wasn't eligible and i was like well i've got x amount of pto i've got x amount of sick leave we have some policies that can help but like unfortunately i can't just leave i can't i can't uproot everything and go to texas to be with my family if this is it type of thing and luckily we were able to do it back home um, so once again, they pumped her full of platelets, they pumped her full of blood, they pumped her full of antibiotics. Um, my dad and I flew down the next week, packed up the car, which like I didn't mention in the process, her birthday, she celebrated in Texas in February, her fourth birthday. And, uh, the amount of gifts that showed up, like the, the, it wasn't as nice as the one in Seattle because we weren't bone marrow transplant so we could we had a, a bit more freedom but like the room we had at ron mcdonald house was like a standard two queen bed hotel type room uh like a third of the room was just gifts and like three cakes got delivered to the hospital the hospital threw her a birthday party like i can't a lot of the people yourself included who are listening to this podcast who will digest this were nothing short of amazing for us and I will reiterate that over and over again, because we don't, we don't do what we did and, and make it last as long as we did without that. Um, so we pack all that shit into my wife's Highlander, <laughs> which like my dad and I are driving across the country again, with <laughs> now no rear view mirror because we can't see out the back because of all of the stuff. Uh, so we're, we, we make that trip that this time we, we decided to go slow and we stayed at night in a hotel to 47 hours this time. <laughs> Soft. <laughs> yeah, dude, I felt so bad. I had to stop. It was hilarious. We, we were driving through Boise and I could not stay awake. Stopped at a gas station. Couldn't sleep at all because we thought they were people trying to break into the car and they were just people at the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> we're so sleep deprived it was that was one like i said a bunch of crazy stories from that so like i pulled off to a rest stop i looked at when the sun strength coach brain the sun comes up in three and a half hours that's two full sleep cycles so like we should be okay if we sleep until the sun comes up plus it'll reset our circadian rhythm it was the stupidest logic ever for the fact that we'd been up for 36 hours at that point uh so we stopped, we slept, we made the last trek home. Uh, but yeah, Jaden so flew home. That was like a Sunday, Monday, because we got home Monday afternoon and then she had a checkup with her oncologist Tuesday morning. Um, that one sucked. That one, I mean, she's a very, <laughs> she's very blunt. She's a, which we appreciate. Uh, she was absolutely amazing for us the whole time, but she's like, hey, I'm gonna tell you how it is. So, which I appreciate because it's like, okay, I now know the worst possible option. Anything other than that is automatically a win. 
So she, you know, here's the protocol. Um, there's nothing better. So let's do it. Okay. We got to have uh, the, the, the do not resuscitate talk, like in the mm -hmm. condition she's in, it's not going to be worth your time as a family that if she goes, if her heart stops or whatever, to try to crank on her body and CPR and, and like that, oh. that sucks, dude. Um, yeah. That talk was, I mean, you know, we were, we were aware of how real the situation was, but like, dear Lord, yeah. <laughs> everybody's like, oh, we're so happy to see you. And then we have that talk and it was like, okay. Okay, this is real again. Cool. We we get the high of like we have still have a chance. We still have a chance. We still have an option. Um, but here's just the reality of the situation. Lucky for us, the drugs worked really well. She went from ninety six present to eighty percent pre no to sixty percent present. So it, it mm. cut it you know quite a bit significantly. And um, she was able to start walking again. We were able to have a couple months of normal kid right. Her hip healed up. Uh, she, I mean, I have a video of her. I remember like six weeks prior to me taking the video, she was wheelchair bound, couldn't, couldn't support weight. I put her on the scale of her appointment and she fell because she couldn't stand on her leg. Like, and six weeks later, she was jumping on the trampoline. <laughs> That's awesome. And so like, I mean, we're, things are good. Life is good. Um, life is easy, I should say. It, it was it was very easy to live that way, comparatively. Um, God, July? No, June. Our, our draw in June. We drew. No, it was it was end of June. So we drew on my birthday, June twenty eighth, um, and the results came back that we had. No, May was when they stopped. Results came back that we had not decreased. So history would say. Stop working. They would stop working. But we also don't know what that means, right? Because even if the drugs have stopped working, does that mean we're going to see a massive growth? Does that mean we're going to see a slow growth? Like, once again, the goal of this, that, that regiment was time. That was it. By her time. So if we see, if we go from... 50 or 60% to 65% or to 70%, like, yeah, it's growth and it's unfortunate, but it's still not that bad. So we still have time. Um, so that was the end of May. That was like Memorial Day weekend. End of June, once again, my birthday, did our next draw. And at that point, the results came back that we were up to 80% again. So like what we had unfortunately learned to expect was like the drugs stopped working, the next one's gonna show an increase and we're gonna be right back into this craziness. The, uh, with that though, um, we're super connected, my wife is, I don't, I don't talk to other parents. Um, we're super connected with the rest of the AML, the RAM phenotype AML community. And so my wife reached out into the Facebook group of one of many Facebook groups that there are for these, these kids and these families and said, this is what we're looking at seeing. I need to know every drug regimen all of you have tried and specific. And so emails flooding like, Hey, we tried this one. Hey, we tried that one. Hey, we look at this, look at that. Try this one in conjunction with that one. Like all these things <clears throat> in another family whose son had recently passed away. Unfortunately, um, her, that kid's dad, his dad, sent my wife an email with all of it organized with the cell receptors that it targeted and said, we were planning on looking at X, Y, and Z drugs before their son passed away. So present this to your team. And they all know who like Dr. Machinci is in Seattle because he's the guy. So they're like, send this to Dr. Machinci, send this to your primary oncologist, send it to your doctor in Houston because he's on the team now. He's an amazing human. Um, and see what everybody thinks we should do. And that was like, fuck, that was, that was like mid July. And so we, we sent that to them and our, our primary, primary oncologist loves how organized my wife is. Cause she goes, that's perfect because now we don't have to think we can just go, does it, what does this one look like? Well, she has that receptor well, da, da, and make it easy instead of them do that work. So uh, they're like, cool. 
um, this is, God, this one's going to get shitty. Um, the, that was like July 14th, I think is when she sent that. July 15th, we get the, they set up an appointment with us for the 31st because we were supposed to go on her Make-A-Wish the 20th through the 24th. Um, I was also supposed to go to San Diego to watch New Zealand play Fiji and rugby that on the 19th. And I was going to then fly to LA and meet them. We're going to go to Disneyland the 18th. So it gets fever for people who aren't aware with, 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 uh, kids with cancer, with anybody with cancer, um, kid gets a fever and they're in the middle of treatment. You automatically go to the ER because they could have a bacterial infection. If they are immune compromised, they can't fight that bacterial infection and it can lead to their death. So it's like, Soap gets a fever. My wife calls me freaking out. I'm at work. She's like, Soap has a fever. We're literally two days away from leaving for her Make-A-Wish. I'm going to the clinic to see if they can figure it out. Can you meet me? I'm, I'm scared. I was like, absolutely. My boss, I have an amazing boss who's super supportive. Not that I don't think anybody's bosses aren't supportive when kids have cancer, but um, so I told her like, hey, Soap's got a fever, Jade's freaking out, I gotta go. Head to the clinic, it's like a 10 minute drive from the base I work at, so super quick. We get there and our oncologist understands the gravity of like, make a wish trip. So she's like, we're gonna do everything we can to get you on that plane Saturday morning, this is Thursday afternoon. So she recommends we admit for the night, pump her full of drugs, pump her full of platelets, pump her full of blood, and go. So I cancel my trip to go watch rugby the next day. Um, and then we stay the night. I were my wife's, I think, yeah, my wife stayed the night with her that Thursday night. I went to work the next day and then switched her out in the afternoon and Friday, the plan was to discharge Friday night so that we could be on a plane Saturday morning. Our doctors come in and say, Hey, um, like, we don't know how to tell you this, but make a wish canceled your trip. They don't think she's healthy enough to travel. This is July 19th. Um, sucks, but, uh, my wife and I both are pretty fairly logical thinkers to where like, they're looking out for our daughter's best interest. If she gets sick while we're down there, we're stuck in a hospital 2000 miles from our home with our oldest daughter with that. Right. It just, it was like, okay, you know, that's life. That's July 19th. We go home that night. The 20th so starts feeling gross. Doesn't feel good. Can't figure out what's going on. Um, can't keep any food down. Just throwing up everything. Water, blueberries, whatever. Blueberries distinctly because when she threw it up, it looked like blood and it scared the hell out of me. That's why I remember that. Um, so we take her back in. Take her back into the hospital on the 20th. Check in. Um, have them run some tests. Take some x-rays. Uh, that night, I remember specifically one of our oncologists who like was the oncologist on staff when we got diagnosed in the, in the ER, um, comes in and goes, Hey, we're seeing something weird. Don't, I'm not going to tell you what it's called. Cause I don't want you to look it up. Don't freak out. We're going to do some more, take some more images. And, uh, turned out she had an infection in her intestines that she couldn't fight, didn't have an immune system. They, the plan then was like, if, if, we can beat this thing. It's going to take weeks of just pumping her full of antibiotics. We gave her a, uh, an IV drip of like just pure lipids. So she would have nutrients in her body to, to survive. Um, and then she had a feeding tube in cause we had to give her so many drugs orally that it was just easier. So they switched that to one that sucked the contents out of her stomach to hopefully pull everything out, to give her a shot. Like I said, that was the 20th, um, 145. July 24th, she passed away. So, and I mean, other than, other than losing my daughter, everything happened in the absolute easiest way possible. So if just went to sleep, just didn't wake up. And, uh, we were sitting there late into the 23rd, early into the 24th. My sister and her wife had come up from LA. My parents were there and we're all just waiting. Cause I mean, it became very evident that day that she didn't have weeks like they thought she did. Um, 
And so we were like, all right, called everybody. Like I said, my sister flew up like 10 a.m. I said, hey, you guys need to get up here. We don't have a lot of time. They were there 7 p.m. that night. I mean, it's L.A., so like two hours, right? But still, on a plane, no questions asked. Cool, we'll be there. My parents picked them up. Um, we And, yeah, we stayed there. They stayed. Luckily, the hospital. God, this hospital. Mixed feelings about this hospital. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing people. Like, my daughter dying there isn't mixed feelings. Like they took such good care of us. They, they are amazing for that. My truck got stolen <laughs> on Christmas. The first year we were diagnosed and the day so fast away, my parents' car got stolen. It's not in a great area of Tacoma. <laughs> so like, if it wasn't for the care we received, I would curse that place until the end of my days. <laughs> but, uh, so like they cleared out a room next to us. There was a family with a non-life-threatening overnight condition. Like, so they said, cool, you guys are gone. Go to a different room. We'll put you somewhere else. They gave my family that room. So anybody who wanted to stay the night could stay. Um, coffee, tea, snacks, gave us a bunch of stuff. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, she went quick. With, like we were up at, at 1, 1 a.m., right? <laughs> and my sister and her wife had gone next door to go to bed. My parents had gone home and we're sitting there and uh, it would, my wife and I just looked at each other. I was like, should we go to sleep? And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's rest. Hopefully we have another day. It's going to be emotional. Everybody's coming to visit, right? All the family, like I said, both of our families are in the area. So it was like, we had a minimum of 20 people in the room at all times, which was awesome. We're both super family oriented. I can talk to a wall. I'm super social. So like <laughs> I was happy as can be. Everybody's here. Um, and we woke up to the doctor checking, had the stethoscope on her and, and she was gone. And uh, it was oddly peaceful like obviously it sucks as uh as so many things went well for us and i learned so much about the type of person i want to be during all of this so it was like all of that angst and, and the anxiety and the stress and everything was now gone and you're just sitting in a moment Obviously, I'd tr I would trade all of the positive lessons to have my kid back, but uh, we learned a lot from her, man. Haven't, <clears throat> Charlotte, you know, being a part of the entire process too, how did, oh, how did how'd you learn from her as well? Oh, she's amazing. I remember your specific post where you said, essentially, right around that time of the 19th when you guys went in and you kind of got the the news, like you knew it was ending. And uh, I think, I think your post said something to the effect of Charlotte kind of digested it. And then she played with her sister. Yeah. Like, yeah. So um, Charlotte is the best big sister I've ever seen. Constantly did everything to make Sophia happy, make her comfortable. And, uh, at the same time was, God, my kids, she's, she's amazing. Um, just watching her be a kid. Right. And, and it's, I feel like we don't take kids serious enough. Mm -hmm. And I say stuff like that, like, so told us she wanted to be a butterfly one day. And it's like, obviously <laughs> don't take that serious. <laughs> but like, Charlotte, uh, we told her like Jade and I are a mess. And Charlotte's like watching something on TV and looks at us and it's like, well, you know, comes over and goes, well, what's wrong? We tell her like, Hey, this is going to die. Like, this is a very hard end to a, you know, almost three years of our life. And Sophie four at the time of her passing, this is her existence, right? That's our relationship with our daughter is trying to keep her alive. And so, um, and Charlotte it reacted as expected, right? She cried. Why? Why does this have, have to happen to Sissy? I don't have any more siblings. How are we supposed to, like, why is this happening? 
And it was one of those things like, I can't explain to you why kids die. Um, but after she gathered herself, had a good cry, gathered herself, and just sat down and started playing. Sitting on the bed with self. We're a big Bluey family. Playing with our little Bluey action figures. Uh, and uh, talking to self. And you'd see self kind of nod or shake her head or she'd say something like, that girl, the, up until like that last day, she was, she was alive the full day. Um, in between sleeping, she does this thing when she's not actually asleep where she'll like, just to remind you she's there. And like, are we're talking to our doctors and they're telling us the severity of everything. And they're asking how, if she's, if she's comfortable, she's this, if she's that, we're like, yeah, she's herself. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, Soph is a up and running around laughing, giggling. We told him like, Every like 15 minutes or so, she does her big fake yawn to remind you that she's there. And, and then sure enough, I said it in on cue. Obviously, she's probably listening. But she did it. And our doctors were just like, yeah, I'd say she's herself. Like, she's – but yeah, so her and her and Char are playing and Char's talking to her. And Self's favorite animals were tigers. So they're talking about – tiger. we had all of her tiger stuffies at the hospital. So, like, we're talking close to, like, 40 stuffed animals with just tigers of various sizes and things. Um, and so we got them all over the bed and Char's playing with them there. And it's just like, and oh, dude, she, and it's one of those things where like, I feel guilty as a parent for my child consoling me because that's not mm-hmm. her job. No, nope. that is not her job at all. But like, I'm sitting there going through it and Char just comes up, rubs my back. <laughs> it's okay, dad. <laughs> yeah, I have exceptional children <laughs> i remember uh something that you had you had said about that like you know just the the strength and the perspective you know being able to learn from her at such a young age right yeah man it's like i said we don't we we don't take kids seriously enough and it's obviously like wanting to be a butterfly or a velociraptor or whatever when they grow up yeah. isn't to be taken seriously but there's there's so much beauty in the way that your kids see life and the way that they, they go about coping with things. Like it's okay. You, you watch a kid and they, you know, they cry about everything, everything, but it's like, that's people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you got kids, you know, everything, <laughs> but they're also the happiest people on the planet. Yep. And so it's like, why, why do we as adults feel we can't fe- you know, we don't have the, that depth of feeling anymore because at some point we decided it wasn't acceptable. And it's like, dude, fuck that. If I'm happy, I'm going to be happy. And if I'm sad, I'm going to be sad. Like, and I don't want to, I'm, and when self relapsed, I started therapy, um, mostly because Charlotte and I fought like crazy. One, we're way too similar. So we fight anyway, <laughs> but, um, I needed to learn new skills because I didn't want to just fight with my daughter. And, uh, my therapist talks about it all the time, like, so we, we so often mask everything as frustration or anger because we don't know how to feel the other things as adults because we, we, we've compartmentalized everything to happy or mad. That's it, especially as men. And so being able to feel those things and like being frustrated and not meaning I'm going to lash out and yell and be, mm, I'm dad. No, dude, like I can be frustrated. But I can still love my kid. I can still have a positive interaction with her. And the, the funny thing now is because I didn't have a skill set to do that before, I'm still working on it, obviously. When I do that now, when I can be frustrated and express my frustration to my wife and daughter, but then not freak out and yell and be loud or whatever. And there, my daughter's like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, it's, but yeah, like they kids get it, man. Like, being your, your authentic self and feeling things that you're going to feel, it, it has made, it's made the, at least for me, it's made the process, the grieving process. And as much as a, it's been a, years of grieving, right? Because it went from stress and anxiety to now just emptiness in pertaining to my daughter. I still have a very full life. I love the life I get to live. I just am missing a piece of it now. But, um, yeah, we went from stress and anxiety to just a, a piece of it now that like, and it's it's weird, dude. Like, I don't even get sad when I think about her that often. I, I, I have my moments, right? It's my kid and, and 
I'm unfortunately not going to get to watch her grow up and get married and graduate from high school and college, like all these things that are so important and there are these big life moments I'm going to miss with her. But I, I had to do the best four years of my life were hanging out with her, my oldest daughter and my wife. So like, it's hard to not be happy for the time we had as much as I'm sad that she's not here. Yeah. Cause like nothing's going to break that bond that you all have. Like you yeah. have that, th those memories and that, uh, that shared life experience together. A question that I have for you was you were talking about the bone marrow and donation of blood and whatnot. Like I specifically remember the, uh, be the match event at Towson back in the day, like things of that nature, hearing your story, like clearly people need to start to take those things more seriously as a human being, not just as a strength and conditioning coach, but like you, you have the ability to help other people that, truly do need this life giving thing. Yeah, man. It's uh it it especially going through cancer treatment during COVID because there was there was days where they were like, "Hey, we don't have platelets. We don't have blood. We don't have the things you need because there's a shortage." And, you know, so that's just and that's not even super specialized stuff, right? That marrow donation is generally very directed donating blood's like a fairly normal thing and uh and we went through days where they brought in a bag of platelets and there was that much in the like the peacock of the the tube to go into the bag and that was all they had like it was and so 100 uh, percent. and my wife and i joke because we we're both registered with be the match not from when self got diagnosed from undergrad because i needed extra credit in anatomy um and so we're registered with them for that reason. I've never gotten an email asking for my marrow, but I'm still in that system and it's too easy, right? It's like a cheek swab. Yep. <laughs> and it's, it, but there's, there's legitimate life and death consequences for all of that stuff for marrow. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter's elementary school ran a, a blood drive for us, which was awesome, right? Pulled the truck up to the school. We donated a bunch of our friends, every teacher in the school came out and donated the principal, every, like when I say, dude, when I, I keep coming back to the support we've gotten, I mean, we're talking standing room only at Soap's funeral service, like 200 people at her funeral service. Some I'm getting texts from athletes. I used to coach like, Hey, my flight got canceled. Otherwise I'd be there. There's uniformed service personnel in uniform who left work to come up, to come to her service. Like, we do i can't speak to the support i i'll keep coming back to it because it was so impactful for me um, especially the time right 2021 sucked for most people the yeah. world's falling in on itself everybody hates everybody we're so <laughs> divided and i got to watch i got to sit, i mean i was a part of it obviously it benefited my family but we got to sit back and watch as as people i didn't even know dude i had a job interview and the lady interviewing me looked at me on zoom and went you're the kid who the gofundme came out for your daughter. And I was like, that's a trip. <laughs> <laughs> like that was, I mean, even now, right? Even after her death, the amount of support we've gotten, I, I laugh because I get my best posts on Instagram, right? We get your, oh, you're this and that. The two best posts I have are when she got diagnosed and when she died. Um, you've reached 47% outside of your network. And it's like, dude, fuck you, Instagram. But, um, <laughs> but that's when like the, the, the outpouring of support, the outpouring of, of love from people who I don't know, people who, you know, hell dude, we probably wouldn't have any sort of relationship other than Instagram. Hey, you're a strength coach too. If this doesn't happen and it's been, it was, it was needed. I'll, I'll tell you that it made me, it, it brought back a lot of faith in humanity for me and a lot of the kindness of people and, and kind of reiterated my own life philosophy of like, everybody just wants to do the right thing. They just need direction to do it. And it's, it's super easy when something like this comes up because you can pour into the people who need the help. The question that people are probably asking and wondering themselves right now is, you know, what does life look like now? How, do, how does somebody move forward in a situation like this? How do you move forward? Maybe there's a coach out there that's going through it as well. What does life look like now? 
it, it's interesting. Um, so we went to Hawaii literally the day after her service. Um, my wife and I both said we owe a lot to Charlotte. She very unselfishly sat on the sideline and we told her like, we're going to do everything we can to support you and do the things you want to do. But like, we have to go into, we have to go after all of these things for your sister, because if we don't, she doesn't live. So we need to do everything we can. And Charlotte basically, like, I mean, there was, she's a kid. There was times where it was like, yeah. come on. <laughs> I mean, she got three Disneyland trips canceled because of Sophia's oh. cancer treatment. It was like, oh, we're, you know, first one oh. she got diagnosed. The second one was the first go around at her make a wish. And the third one was her, the second go at her make a wish. And it was just like, and every time, like even this last one, like, Hey, they canceled our trip. We're not going to Disneyland. And she just, again, and it was like, like come on. <laughs> so we, we said, we have to do something. We have to do something where we take the time, step away and just love on each other as a family away from the world. Right. We, so there's no place further than from Washington than an Island in the middle of the Pacific ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and also that I could afford to go to on a moment's notice. Um, so yeah, we went to Hawaii for five days and, uh, during that trip, it was a lot of like, I mean, a lot of reflection. My wife is big on patterns. So like, um, so favorite animal was a tiger. The first thing we see when we get to Hawaii on a billboard has a tiger on it. Um, she found a tiger keychain in a souvenir shop. The, uh, the pennies from heaven thing, um, everywhere we went, every time we'd go to a new place, we'd find a penny on the ground. Like it's, uh, the way I like to put it is we're going to, we didn't stop living life in spite of what she had to do. We changed how we lived it. So we're not going to stop living life now. Um, if anything, now we have a lot more firepower to why we should do things, why we should take a family vacation every year, why we should take weekends. And I mean, I live in one of the most beautiful States in the country, why we should go camp on random weekends every summer. Why, why we can say yes to silly things. I'm taking Charlotte on a date tonight for just because, I mean, the one, that's the type of dad I want to be, but two, like, I have no reason to say no. And so like, if we don't get to live life with her, we get to live life for her. We're going to go everywhere. We're going to like, we told both girls when we get done with cancer, we're going to Australia. Like I said, couldn't afford that on a moment's notice, but mine and my wife's 15th wedding anniversary is in a couple of years. So we're going to save up. We're going to go to Australia and we're going to go do whatever, because I would rather on my deathbed with my family around me, be able to say, guy, you remember when we did this? Do you remember when we did that? Do you remember that time we were inner tubing and I threw you off so hard? Like that's life. That's what matters more than anything is the interactions you have with the people you care about most. So that's how we're going to live. And does it fucking suck sometimes? Yes, dude. I've cried every day the last three years. And I didn't probably cry a day the 10 years prior to that. But that's fine. Right? That's, that's, that's part of this. That's part of the healing. That's part of going through it. And it's so soothing. Instead of stuffing it down deep and getting pissed off all the time, it's like, no, I'll just, I'll just cry. I'll just cry if I need to. And if I don't, I won't. Like, I have life to live. We have life to live. Like I said, if not with her, then for her. Yeah, that, I couldn't agree more. When in, one of the things I wrote down was, you know, during all of the the processes of the different cocktails, like, and you're not wanting to give up, like, with your bluntness, were you trying to be like, well, what about, like, you know what I mean? Were you trying to say, like, hey, okay, how do you, you know, out strength coach it here? Like, okay, well, what if we have some of this and let's get some of this, you know, like, that's luckily that was so I decided early on I wasn't I wasn't going to get into the science side of it my wife went went that route she was always reading this and that I because because of the understanding we have of the body for, because of our job I didn't yeah. want to and like I so I'm strength coach I also teach online uh as an adjunct for a local community college and uh so I teach anatomy and, and I teach a lot of these classes where we talk about the cellular stuff and it's like I don't want to I don't want to know what's going on. I want to be dad. Uh, That's why I'm here. I am here to be the father to my daughter and whatever she needs from that standpoint versus, and it's funny because then I would get talked to, I felt like I got talked to like a first grader because I'm like, <laughs> I know what the liver does. 
like <laughs> but um so it took a lot of like set all of my education set all of my work experience all these things aside and just let people tell me what the average father in this situation needs to know so but that was that was my goal like if i dive down the rabbit hole i will be stuck there and unfortunately it'll take my attention away from my family and they need me more than i need to know what's going on so that was for me that's a brilliant way to look at it though like and i'm I'm glad you said that for any parent that may be going through it as like that's a i wouldn't have done that with that like if something happens to my children i okay like now it probably helps like you said that your wife was doing it so maybe that helped your brain but yeah well good perspective yeah it it it, it helped my wife did it. She was always in those conversations and I was just, where do you need me to drive? What do you need me to pick up? When do you need me there? Cause that um, for me, that's where I have always struggled in my relationship and as a father, because I was a strength coach, right? We work, we're 90 hours a week on a, on a good week. And yeah. so like leaving college sports, working with the military, having a 40 hour a week job was, not, I mean, I wanted to be a strength coach with the military. Like I said, I love that population, but I want to be dad. Being called dad is the best thing I've ever been called in my life. Next to being called uh, Schmook, my wife's nickname for me. Those are my two favorite things on the planet. So why would I take my attention away from just being those? There's no better way to, unless you have something else to say, I don't think there's a better way to put a bow on that. I, I out, the only things I have to say outside of uh, the things I always said, hug your kids, donate blood, and uh, if you pray, keep praying. There's a lot of kids still going through it. Um, if you don't mind, three things I want to shout out on here. Project Stella through Fred Hutch is the research effort going into looking at uh, RAM phenotype AML leukemia. Because it's so rare, they get no funding from anybody unless they fundraise project Stella. It's uh, it's uh, they have a great website. I can send you the link for it. Um, second one, like I said earlier, see you later, Washington, one of the foundations who not only gave us every toy we could ever ask for, for our children on the planet, but like gas gift cards, grocery gift cards paid for a zoo membership because it's close enough to the house that we could go because it's within that half hour drive to the hospital. Um, they're great people. They've been on our side the whole time. And then the last one is uh, Happy Bundles is a foundation. Uh, Major League Rugby player in the Seattle area here. He and his wife, it's their foundation. They've been nothing short of outstanding for us. There's a bunch more, but these are just the three that I like to highlight. Dan and Candace Creel with Happy Bundles, phenomenal people. And they're, they run it themselves. Like they're not some big corporation that he plays rugby. She runs a foundation and they send packages to families all over the country, all over the world to help add a little brightness to their day when they're going through this. See you later, Washington and Project Stella. Those three things, um, two of them, we wouldn't be where we are without with the foundations and then Project Stella is the research effort so that uh, families don't have to go through what we went through. Yeah, a- amen to that. We will have all that information down there um, and we'll... I'd like you to connect us somehow with the people at Project Stella then to find a way that we can do some version of a virtual lift-a-thon or something to raise awareness because, yeah, we'll we'll get that going. Yeah, dude, no, that's too easy. Um, thank you for coming on. Again, if there's anything else you want to leave with to end this show, uh, I want you to kind of drive it. But thank you for coming on and, and allowing this to be a, you know, a version of a living testimony to your daughter and to – everything over the last uh you know couple years of her life yeah brother i appreciate it man i will i'll take every opportunity to talk about my kids like i said they're exceptional um i'll just leave it at that i can all ramble otherwise i have great kids and i'm very thankful for the life i get to live live uh like i said now for sophia since i don't get to do it with her enjoy date night tonight with uh with charlotte absolutely can't we're going bowling so i can't wait have a good one man congratulations on making it to the end of the video why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it you can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking sharing subscribing and commenting thank you